Okay. Can everyone hear me? All right. Um, welcome to this lecture about design for co-op games. Um, who am I? I am Patrick Lasota, but uh, most people call me Fluffy, and the only ones who call me Patrick is uh, my mom, my brother, and my lead programmer when he's angry with me. So uh, please call me Fluffy. Uh, I'm a designer at Arrowhead. Uh, I've been at Arrowhead for five years, but I started out as a community manager for uh, Magica. Uh, moved on doing some uh, scripting and design for the first real Magicka expansion, The Stars Are Left. And from there on out, I started working as a designer. Uh, I've been uh, working lately on Helldivers, which we are showing out here in our monitor, and has been the designer for that, uh, that entire project. So, what is co-op? Generally, when speaking about co-op games, uh, we talk about games that are players versus AI. So you don't have a human opponent element in it. And that is not true for all cases, but mostly the entire game will revolve around you fighting the AI. And I'd like to uh, make a difference between tacked on co-op and core co-op. And tacked on co-op, that is what you have when you take a single player game and you add the co-op element. And this is very common nowadays with games like Borderlands and um, Aliens, Colonial Marines, and stuff like that. That is co-op that is added to a single player experience. Uh, it has some upsides. Mainly, it's, um, it's a bit easier to implement than the full design co-op. But it's still a lot of extra work, mind you, but it's not quite the same. Uh, and then we have core co-op, which is the, when the entire game is designed around the core co-op experience, where it's very clearly visible that the game is designed with co-op in mind and that you're supposed to play it with multiple people. Magicka was very much such a game, and Helldivers is too. Uh, and the downside with core co-op is that they're often worse single-player games. They're often not as fun in single-player as regular single player games, because it's not, it's not their intended purpose. So, it has its downsides. So why should you make a co-op game? Well, because gamers like to play together. Uh, humans are, in, in their basic form, very social creatures. And playing with your friends is pretty much always fun. Unless you have shitty friends, but that's not my problem. Um, Co-op games do not need fine balancing. And this is a truth with modification. I'm going to touch on this further later. Uh, but in essence, the AI doesn't mind losing. You're not playing a human opponent. It doesn't need to be fair. And co-op is automatically fun. <laughs> this is true for me, uh, especially in a game like Aliens Colonial Marines. Uh, I do not think it's a very good game at all, and it has a huge amount of flaws, but I still play through it with my friends. They basically said, oh, it's $3 on Steam. Let's play this in co-op. And I'm like, but, but it's a bad game. I'm like, eh, it's co-op. And we did, and we had fun. So it's automatically a bit extra fun because your friends add to the experience. I'd like to liken it to, uh, to watching a bad movie with your friends. You sit there, you're in the sofa, you're eating popcorn or whatever, and you're sort of ripping on the movie because it's, it's horrible, but you're still having fun together. And there are very few great co-op games. There are very few games that are true co-op games and really good co-op experiences. So there's a huge market here that isn't used that much. That it, it, you can enter this market and just pretty much immediately be successful, successful if your game is good, because there aren't many good games. There are co-op games. So co-op design. And this is about making a co-op-centric game, where the core is co-op. And the first thing I'm going to use, I'm going to use a buzzword 
So I look like, this is what bosses do when they promote synergy in meetings that you're not in. Um, create synergy. And that is synergy between players. Create abilities that interact for multiple people. Make it possible to reload someone else's weapon. Help them out. Um, if they're down, bring them up. Uh, this is something that's done too little in games. And it's often something that's missed when you have a single player game that has co-op tacked on. There are great examples of this even in MOBAs like Dota 2 where there's a character that can throw your hero onto the enemy to engage for a kill or even save you by picking you up and throwing you back onto the safety behind your lines. And there's too little synergy often in co-op games. So it's very important to have that. A player should always have something to do. Um, this is true for pretty much all design for making any game, but it becomes doubly true in co-op games. Because you are multiple people and everyone's supposed to have fun, but it's easy to forget that if you have a vehicle with four people, only the driver is really engaging with the game and the rest of the people are just along for the ride. So my suggestion there is give the other people something to do constantly. It doesn't need to be something they must do, but just giving the passengers the ability to fire a weapon is often enough to keep him on his toes and interacting with the game. It makes him look out for enemies. It, it gives the player the knowledge that they are not just sitting and doing nothing. And the computer does not mind losing. This is what I touched a bit earlier on too. Uh, the computer can die however much you want. And I'd say it's even an upside to have fodder enemies. Enemies that are just there for the purpose of dying. They're interesting to kill. They explode in a, in a gory cloud of uh, blood if that's the kind of game you're making, or they're just generally fun to engage. They don't need to be tricky. They don't need to be good. They just need to be there. And balance is tricky but insensitive. I had this earlier too, and what I think there is that it's tricky to balance for the players to constantly have a challenge, but it's unsensitive in the sense that you don't need to have a weapon that does exactly the same amount of damage as all other weapons. You're not fighting human opponents. They won't call foul. They won't say, that's unfair, that's a noob tube, it's the wrong way to play, because the AI doesn't know that. You can have immensely powerful weapons that just slaughter hordes of enemies, something we can see in many co-op games like Serious Sam, for example. And it's okay, because there's no, there's no opponent to tell you that's unfair. It's fine. But constantly keeping the player challenged, that's the tricky part of it. If you, if you just have fodder enemies, and you do pretty much nothing else, the player's gonna kill a ton of enemies, and then he's gonna kill a ton more, and there's nothing else for him to do. If there's no challenge, it's not going to be a fun game. Unified player UI is something we learned pretty late with Helldivers. And that is that when you're making a co-op game, you need to constantly represent all of your players' existence in the game. It doesn't matter if it's a loading screen or uh, wherever in the game but you should always represent the players as being in the game, and often you'd like to represent some kind of status as well. Are they hurt? Do they have low HP? Are they low on ammo? Can I help them in any way? Things like that. And in Helldivers, for example, we figured this out because we needed to represent if the player was talking or not. This was actually a technical requirement from Sony that they came back to us and said, you can't see if a player is using their voice over IP when loading into the game. 
And we started sitting down like, oh, how are we gonna solve this? Are we just gonna like add on the UIs on the loading screens or, or are we gonna make a new UI for this so you can see what the players are doing? And it turns out it was that easy. It was just adding the same UI we have in the entire game to the loading screen. And I think it might be worth exploring if you're making a co-op game, a solution that just constantly keeps the player's UI on screen at all times. So I'm gonna recommend a couple of co-op games that are, I think, are good elements of co-op. Uh, Dungeon Defenders, a game with many flaws, but very brilliant co-op. It's basically a tower defense and hero defense game mixed together. It requires players to engage enemies from multiple avenues by using traps, towers, blockers, constructions basically. But also come together and work together when you have a boss coming from a specific avenue. And this requires a lot of communication in the higher levels. Uh, I think the second game is coming out soon, or if it's already out, I haven't played it yet. But it's highly recommended to sit down four players and just play that a bit. And then I'm gonna say World of Warcraft, and you're gonna say, but that's an MMO. Yes. But I think the key to why MMOs are so successful is because their PvE, PvE, player versus environment element, the dungeons, the raids, that's basically co-op. That's a co-op game within the MMO aspect of the game. World of Warcraft has some of the most well-designed dungeons and raids in MMOs today. They require a lot of communication, very high precision in execution, and they require you to simply play as a team and play together. And I'd say they're a shining example of co-op. World of Warcraft is also pretty much the best example of a concept called the Holy Trinity, which is the tank, the healer, and the damage dealer. The tank has a specific role to mitigate damage, to engage the enemies and keep them occupied. The healer makes sure the tank doesn't die, or the rest of the group doesn't die. And the damage dealer must make sure that the encounter sometimes ends. And this is also something that's been discussed highly with games like Guild Wars that removed it. They tried to remove the Holy Trinity. And it worked out all right. But I'd say it's not something you need to pigeonhole people into. Because with Magicka, we noticed that you have all the abilities in the entire game at your fingertips, but people still took on roles. They wanted to be the guy that keeps their friends alive. They wanted to be the person who, who just does tons of fire damage and blows things apart. So people find these roles naturally because they want to. And World of Warcraft is also a, a well-defined example of that. And then I'm gonna recommend Castle Crashers. And also a game with uh, some severe flaws that's been uh, <clears throat> highlighted by Anita Sarkeesian recently. But I'm still gonna recommend it because it does something that's not that common in co-op games. It makes players work together at first, but adds a competitive element in between them. So you both get to fight the enemies with your friends and your friends with that. Another great example of how that is done is also Gauntlet, a game we released recently, where you fight the enemies, but you also wanna be the best among your friends. And I feel this was over far too quickly. I don't actually know how long this took. <laughs> but I'm gonna end with a quote from our CEO, Johan. A game for everyone is a game for no one. And this is the studio motto today at Arrowhead. And it basically means that if you make a game that tries to please everyone, you're gonna end up pleasing no one. So make the game you wanna make that you think are fun, and like-minded people will also think that the game is fun. 
And with that, we're going to open for questions. We have one up there already. I thought of that citation, and I think uh, that uh, can't you uh, can't you undersöka what heter det? Examine. Examine uh, what uh, a specific group of players that are not so close to your own experience uh, is going to enjoy and uh, going for doing something that pleases them. This is definitely true uh, and I agree with you. I mean, if you're making a game for a specific group, you're still not going to make a game for everyone. You're going to make a game for, for those people. Um, for me, personally, that would be something very hard to do. Um, I think. I have never tried, actually, to make a game that I wouldn't personally like. But I know that I ended up playing Helldivers during its development at least an hour a day for two years. That's a lot of game time to put into a game that you do not self, yourself like. So it's, it's personal preference, but uh, I guess you could make that, yes. But I think that, that, that it can be important to think also outside your own group to think what uh, other groups, for, because there are so many consumer groups out there. You can go for women, you can go for men, you can go for children. And maybe those groups don't like the same games as you do. This is true. But then maybe someone else should make games for them and not me. And that's, I, I think you lifted something interesting there as well. You said you make games for, for women or men. Um, and I think it's important to not make that distinction. To, uh, to make games for a type of personality, not for someone's sex, because it, that, that doesn't matter. That's also true. More questions? Down here? So you mentioned the co-op games uh, where you also have a competitive element between the players. I'm kind of surprised that you didn't mention Zelda Four Swords, and I was asking, wondering if you have any special opinion on maybe how it went for Nintendo with the launching of Four Souls. Um, I didn't mention it because I haven't actually played it. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I, as I understood it, Four Swords was not that successful. I agree. Um, I haven't played it myself, so I'm not going to speak on its design elements. But I think it needs, it's a more sensitive situation when you design a game that has a competitive element within the players that need to cooperate as well. Um, especially when it's more than just gathering score. Um, it, it adds an extra, extra crook nook to the yeah. design, definitely. Up here. Uh, you said in the beginning that um, there aren't many uh, co-op games, and it's easy to get into the branch if you if you try to make if you make a good game. Uh, what do you think that is like? Why why is doesn't there exist that many co-op games? That's a very interesting question. I know from from a publishing aspect, from publisher side, uh, all I've ever heard is make sure the game is single player. And I'd like to add to that, that question by more questions. Why did Battlefield ever add a single player aspect? It was never a single player game. But they felt the need to add it anyway. And I'm not quite sure why, why people don't make more co-op games. But while it is a market that has large holes in it, there aren't that many good co-op games, maybe it's not a huge market. I'm not quite sure why, actually. I don't know if I can fully answer that question, but uh, that's what I got. Yep, thank you. Up there, we have someone. Uh. I wanted to ask about <coughs> the specific co-op you have in, uh, for instance, Resident Evil 5 where you are actually uh, not as much, uh, you are actually forced 
to play as a co-op uh, with certain members. It's not some. It's not a choice you have. You uh, to get past certain obstacles. Like you have to launch them up there, and it often becomes quite an inconvenience for the player. Yes, and and this is something interesting we found with Hell Divers as well, where we had the um, the rocket launcher, and you can only reload it if you have a friend who has the reload backpack. And this is something that we just figured out that it, it won't work in the end. We needed to add an element where the player can use it in single player. So you can reload it on your own if you have the backpack, and, but it takes longer time. So it's just more efficient to do it with a friend. But this, this gating of doing grouped content is something we often see in MMOs, like World of Warcraft or Guild Wars or such, where dungeons, you just can't do them alone. You need to bring friends. And this is actually something that's been moved away from a bit in the MMO world. Though I'd say the MMO, the MMO experience is uniquely suited for actually having that element. I think if you're making, I haven't played Resident Evil myself, uh, the five at least. But if you're making a game that is mostly single player and then has some elements of co-op needed, and just needed to complete the game, I think that's a design mistake, to be honest. Um, I'd say that if you, ha if you have a single player game that has co-op elements, do the, the tacked on co-op thing. Don't require people to play in co-op because the game is mostly a single player experience. If you have an MMO where it's so easy to just grab a bunch of people and add them to the mix, then you can do it, but it's, it's up to the developer themselves to make that distinction, but I personally wouldn't do it. Hello, hello. More questions? Down here? Hustle. Hi, I have a question for you, um, and it's about the, to uh, the toxic society. Like, how does Arrowhead uh, handle these situations for people who are mostly to troll or hate? This is an interesting question. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, we've found that, especially with Helldivers, when you give people a lot of responsibility, they sort of rise to the occasion. We have trolls in Helldivers, yes. And we do have a um, report command system, sort of like what uh, Dota does. So if you, um, if you behave poorly, people will report you and you'll be matched with other poorly rated people. But you can also commend people. And something we've done in Helldivers is you get more commends than you get reports. So you should be less like less greedy with your, with your good words mm. than with your bad words. Uh, and that plus the responsibility has created a very nice community for Helldivers where people are very, very helpful towards each other and even go out and do like full guides on the forums for how to be a better player and how to use stratagems or different loadouts and stuff like that, their favorite uh, setups and everything. But I think that toxic community is something that we'll always have to live with. We'll just have to minimize it as much as possible and mitigate the damage that the trolls can do to the people who actually just enjoy playing the game. Does, does this work or? I think so. Okay. Um, uh, I, uh, I just had a question about the, on the same theme uh, about uh, uh, like in a co-op game where you, uh, do you think it is necessary to communicate really well to make a good co-op game or can you like um, because there's a game Dawn Gate I think it's like a MOBA where you basically um, uh, you can't for example you can't chat with the opposing team for example but there's kind of limited things you can say in game as well um, so uh, that negates a lot of like trolling or, or uh, stuff like that, but it also limits what you can communicate to your uh, other players. Mm. That's interesting. Um, I haven't actually played Dawngate, or what it's called, but um, 
in Helldivers, we have the mic open by default. So if you have a mic plugged in, uh, it's going to broadcast. But we found that a lot of players doesn't use the mic. They don't want to. And they play well on their own. And this is something that settles into a co-op game, or any game with multiplayer, really, where people sort of know their roles and know what's expected of them. So maybe you don't always need a chat system, because people find that, well, I'm the tank. I know what I'm going to do. Actually, as an anecdote, the last like four years I've played World of Warcraft, no one has chatted to me in a dungeon, because they don't need to. Everyone knows what we're supposed to do, so we just play the game. I think it's a slight loss, to be honest. I play games to meet new people as well as have fun. Uh, and I think communicating with people is something I enjoy doing. But I can definitely see the merit in just sh shutting that off and giving them a few set commands so that you cannot abuse each other online. I personally would think that's the wrong direction to take but it's definitely something that shields the better part of the community from the trolls. Can I just have a small follow-up question then about uh, a, a game I bought recently, uh, Killing Floor 2. I've played the first one a lot, but there's basically no... Uh, there, are, there are roles, you can be different characters, but they basically all do the same, just kill stuff fast. Um, <clears throat> but there's very little communication in that game. Uh, but it still seems to be... Like, yeah, just as you said, where um, people know what to do when something happens. Is that, you think that's something to do with uh, the people are, people are uh, like, um, they know their roles and the gamers have learned through the years uh, how games work. So people are less uh, surprised when faced with a problem uh, or that it's just in like human nature. And not specifically human nature, but something like it. But that's interesting. You said it's, it's, if it's human nature. And um, I don't remember who said it, but someone said that humans are really good at seeing patterns, at discerning like illogical patterns, put a logic on it, and then understand it. And it's sort of the same with games. We understand, we see what needs to be done. Here's the picture of the level. We know what needs to be done, and we can apply ourselves to solve the problem pretty well. And I think that players also, through the years, have acquired sort of an experience of what is expected of us. Well, the game is called Killing Floor. We're probably going to kill stuff. It's pretty obvious. And then we're going to do it together and make sure no one dies. Uh, and it's something that players carry on from games to games to games. And something that was very apparent with Helldivers that for us, it was like, well, you don't actually need a tutorial. Gamers have played twin stick shooters forever, but not everyone is a gamer who wants to play a new game. So we had to make a, actually an extensive tutorial. Uh, it seemed to have drifted from your question, I think, a bit. It doesn't matter, it's still interesting. <laughs> but in the end, um, yeah, it's, it's, people see patterns. They see what needs to be done and they try to fill that role that best suits them, I think. Can I ask one more thing, or is there someone else who's wanna? Am I hogging the mic? I don't see any other hands. So. Okay, then. One up there. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, let's. Let's send it there, we can yeah. get it back to you later. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know if the mic is on, I can try with my laptop. Uh, we need it for, for the recording. Yeah, I think it's recording. So I'm. I'm kind of interested in, in your designer perspective and, and maybe like a, an semi-aesthetic uh, assessment of um, the difference between single player and, and co-op. Uh, you make it sound very, very kind of hard line. But then we have uh, some games which kind of make the co-presence or co-play uh, aesthetically involved in the game, I'll state the obvious example, Journey, which basically doesn't give you very much co-op in a sense, but it's very much an experience of co-play. How do you see this, this kind of divide, um, kind of as a designer, what, what kind of ideas <laughs> would, you, would you see exploring this, this gray area between actual 
doing tactical work together and kind of building the gameplay and experience around having a co-presence of other players? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't actually think I have an answer for you because that's not something I've considered myself yet. Um, thank you for that one. <laughs> I'm gonna sleep and consider that. If I need to answer on my toes, I'd say that for me, playing games with others is co-op. Uh, but the distinction comes between mechanical co-op that requires people to play and use together and sort of the, the co-op you gain from just having your friend next to you. And both are very nice. I enjoy both pretty much equally, I think. Because for me, it's the social aspect of playing with other people. And Journey is a very interesting example because you don't actually know who this person is. And you can't actually communicate with this person at all. You have some sounds and things, but you can't talk to them. And you still build a pretty, pretty strong bond with this person, despite not having any idea of what, who they actually are. You're just going on an adventure together. And that's, that's something I need to think more about, I think. Thanks. More questions? Let's see. Uh, up there, we have two people. Interesting. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, what you feel are the challenges as, as, and benefits of uh, asymmetr asymmetrical uh, co-op versus symmetrical co-op games. Well, um, asymmetrical co-op is something that's very interesting, but it's, if you make it too asymmetrical, you're gonna, you're gonna engage different kinds of players which, with each part of your game. Um, it's something interesting, but I think it's far more niche than symmetrical co-op games that just allows everyone to do sort of the same thing, but in different ways. In asymmetrical co-op, you're gonna have people who pretty much like different games, but play together. And I think you're gonna have, unless you build a pretty strong matchmaking, you're gonna have issues sort of like engaging friends groups that are already built. Uh, Magicka and, and Helldivers, they, they are very symmetrical co-op games. They, they have the effect on people there where someone buys the game and then tell the friends who they know like to play similar games, we should play Magicka together. Uh, and they do. I think it's a greater challenge, definitely, to make an asymmetrical co-op game. And I think there's possibly a smaller market for it. But that is just my personal sort of off-the-head opinion. So I don't actually have anything to back that up. We had a question up there. Uh, I, I have another question, if that's OK. Yep. Uh, uh, it was regarding uh, actually Dead Space uh, 3, if you have played it. I haven't played it, no. All right, uh, but uh, in that game, uh, you have a very symmetrical uh, uh, co-op game. You can do the same thing, but uh, the other player experience things that uh, you don't even see. Like, you can see you can see him, it looks like he's going crazy, but he gets an entirely different image. You see different people and things are, that are happening. And uh, I, I, I thought it was quite, uh, kind of amazing, but I, I really wanted more of that. I agree. Uh, that is something that is very interesting. And it's sort of conferring your, your experience as a player to your friends that are not experiencing the same thing. It's always going to create this dynamic where people get really interested in what's happening to the other person. And they're going to start like chatting about, oh, all these colors, it's crazy. And they're like, what? We don't see anything. What the hell is going on? And that's even something that could create sort of a psychological effect. I'd love to see it now that you say it. I'd love to see someone make a horror game, a co-op horror game, where people sort of experience different things as they move together. And I agree, that's something I'd definitely like to see more of. Let's see, we had someone up there who wants to say a question. Oh, okay, down here.
So I was thinking about, you talked about communication and that people kind of learn their roles and don't even have to speak to each other. Do you have any cool example of a game which kind of has communication as a core mechanic? So you kind of have to speak. I mean, it kind of sounds like Dead Space. If you see different things, you're kind of encouraged to actually tell the other player. Hmm. Are there any cool games that really use that mechanics in a good way that you know about? Sort of. Um, I think Portal 2 does it pretty well. You, you really need ah, to communicate yeah. to solve the puzzle um, that is at hand, your task. <laughs> but also I'd like to open that to games like Minecraft, which does this sort of under the table, where I'm going to build a castle and I need my friends to help me. And this requires us to coordinate on a level that is, like it takes engineers to do this stuff. They draw blueprints and they, they make these rules for how you communicate about building a, a, a house. And people learn to do this when they're like eight and they play Minecraft. And Minecraft is, is a game that is highly communication centric because it's based on exploration building. You explore, you tell your friends, oh, I found this great forest over here. You should all come here and we'll, we'll build a little tree house. And it's also built on communication for when you build stuff. It's like, oh no, I don't want a window there. Could we put the window maybe here instead? And that, those, I think, are great examples of games that truly require you to communicate. Indeed. Any more questions over here? Uh, something I've noticed be that becomes a problem with uh, games that are co core co-op, or like say, like say something like Hell Divers or or Destiny, with the raids and the weekly things that don't even have matchmaking. Is if I don't have a bunch of friends playing this game, uh, I'm left playing with people randomly matched up with me online. And in games where you have to communicate, that that usually makes playing a living hell. Do you think there's uh, like any kind of reasonable way to try to combat that problem? Yes, I do. And that's a very good question, because I do think it's a problem, for example, in Destiny. But we've found that it's far less of a problem in Helldivers, actually. Because Helldivers is really, really hard when you get up the levels. And it requires people to, to really put their mind to completing the game. And what it brings out is you give people responsibility that this is hard. You're going to have to fight to, to actually make this. And it means that pretty much all play on, on level 6 and above in Helldivers is very serious. It, it brings people together and it makes them work hard to achieve their goals together. It helps that, that you have a game that requires you to be a group more than just the group more than just the, the sum of your parts. You need to actually work together to be efficient, to help each other out, to achieve your goals. I think it's a lot about that, giving the player responsibility, giving the player sort of the, the seriousness, say that this is in your hands. This is in the hands of you and your friends. And people who j are just there to troll, they're gonna be there. And people who are malicious to the community, they're still gonna be there but there's going to be far less of them because they're never going to finish a single level. Uh, because I, I was kind of thinking, with, with my experience with Destiny specifically, with their first raid, uh, players, you need a team because players get split up into groups and they have to do different tasks. And, uh, and, and they're, they're ta challenging tasks, but I've still had actually problems finding people who are competent enough to be able to do it. I mean, kind of a thing where people are over overestimating their ability to actually succeed and taking on a harder challenge that they actually can. Uh, it sounds like you don't have that problem as much with Helldivers. Do you have an idea why, why that might be? Is it? I'm not quite sure, actually. But it's interesting that you say that they require you to do different tasks and it is hard content. And I'm not sure exactly why, why Destiny fails there where we succeed. Um, I haven't played that much Destiny. I haven't played it at max level, for example. So I haven't experienced that myself. But I'd venture a guess that, that I remember it's pretty hard to talk to anyone in Destiny. 
Is it well if you have a or? If you have a PlayStation 3, then you need to get a Bluetooth headset, so not everyone has that, so a lot of oh. people are running around mute. Yeah. I'm not actually sure why that is. I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, but it's something I'd like to, to investigate further. I don't know, how, how are we looking on time? I haven't looked at my clock, I'm having so much fun. Four minutes left. Okay, a few more questions. Anyone? Up there, another one. Last question. Uh, it was regarding something you said uh, just now. Uh, do you feel that uh, people get uh, more responsible and take things uh, in games uh, more seriously if you make them more challenging? Uh, I know from experience in Magicka, that it was a lot of fooling around, but uh, when it became really difficult, like everyone just focused and uh, did what was required. Um, yes, I think this is a general rule regarding pretty much people in general. Um, and it's something I've experienced a lot actually from my career uh, in Arrowhead, uh, is that when you get more responsibility, you, you sharpen up, you rise to the occasion you make sure that, that you make what you need to do. And that is, I think that's a general human effect. If you give people a lot of responsibility and say, I trust you to do this, they're gonna put their mind to it and do their uttermost to succeed. Because in the end, we all crave sort of the acceptance of our peers. So I think that's something that's very important, both in games and in life. Okay, that's it for me. Um, I'm gonna be available up in our monitor over there where you can play Helldivers. And if you'd like to talk more to me, I'll be over there. Thank you.